Mini episode 558 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.info. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Welcome, everyone, to mini-episode number 558 of the FDH Lounge. Rick Morris with you here today. I have two original FDH Lounge dignitaries that will be joining me. Jason Jones, Chris Galloway. Jason Jones also, of course, our senior editor and in charge of our NFL draft coverage. Our face of the company, as it were, for uh, NFL draft coverage as well as NBA draft coverage. Uh, he may not like uh, the comparison when I say essentially the Mel Kuyper of the franchise or the Mike Mayock of the franchise. Uh, and he would probably say I'm not starting us off on a very good note by making those comparisons. But uh, we'll see what he's got to say. Jason, good to have you in, my man. How you doing today? Uh, repulsed by the Mel Kuyper line, but uh, endeared by the Mayak line. So, take okay. what we Well, <laughs> just using it as an analogy, uh, in that uh, you are in charge of our draft coverage, the rankings, etc. And uh, again, uh, for good or for ill, it is uh, Mel Kuyper that uh, people come to think of first and foremost in this uh, industry. So, uh, a logical point of comparison. I see also that we have on our third FDH Lounge original dignitary. Chris Galloway joining us. This has been an annual tradition. Come on, talk draft, both preview and recap. Good to have you on for the preview today, Christopher. Uh, any uh, opening thoughts on this year's NFL draft? Um, I think it's going to be exciting. I think there's going to be a lot of movement. I do as well. And uh, maybe that's one of the places that we should uh, look to start. Uh, Jason, I know that, of course, with our uh, NFL Draft Guide, uh, Pro, uh, Pro Football Draftology 2015. You are writing extensively on the subject of Marcus Mariota, who looks like he is going to uh, cause, I think, some of the instability in the draft this year as far as uh, the, the lack of predictability ahead of time on how things are going to shake out. It's thought that he could go with the second pick. Before all this started, he was thought to be the first pick overall. He has been supplanted in that by Jameis Winston, who is – uh, I think most would say the superior physical talent, and that appears to be what's taking over at this point in time. You and I have talked about this off-air, Jason, in that uh, a year ago, Teddy Bridgewater was a, a real victim of silly season. This year, I think it's more so been a, a fact of people going back in and looking and finding legitimate flaws in Mariota's game, trying to project him from a spread offense to the pro game and saying, hey, wait a minute, and I know that's uh, a lot of uh, where you're coming from on this, is not finding a lot of pro projectability in what you've seen thus far. It's just not as exciting if you've got one guy at the top of the hill and another guy who's supposed to be the next best option is much, much farther down the hills. Chris, your thoughts on uh, Mariota? And I know that, uh, as you well know, I'm not a guy who's big on renouncing my own opinions, but uh, that that is a, a subject where I have sort of taken a, a step backwards. I know that uh, in the case of our Cleveland Browns, uh, I had been an advocate throughout the season of the Browns possibly being in position to get him, and I'm no longer willing to say that should be the case uh, based on uh, some of the questionable uh, natures of uh, how his game looks to project. As Jason has pointed out, uh, in his article about the ability to fit the ball in a tight window that seems to be unproven at this point. What are your thoughts on Mariota? Because he seems like one of the bigger X factors this year. I think if you're any team other than the Eagles, there is no reason to mortgage the future or to, <coughs> or to you know, lose a lot of draft picks, at least in even this year, or to gamble on a guy like Marcus Mariota who doesn't necessarily project that. I think there's too many questions, and um, you know, I, I it's like the Cleveland Browns. I think they would crazy give up multiple draft picks on a guy that does fit. You know, you and I have had a conversation many times about some guys just fit some systems, and their careers would have been better if they were another team. And I think Mariota stepped right into the Eagles to have early success. 
and he could even have long-term success, long-running Chip Kelly just But, you know, you put him on the Browns, you put him on, you know, the Tennessee Titans, I think he's going to struggle, and he's going to struggle for several years. I would really agree with that. I think that's an excellent way to describe him at, at this point is being a system quarterback. And, uh, Jason, it's kind of a long fall, isn't it, from, from where he was coming into the draft, uh, quite possibly the presumptive number one pick, the, uh, the Heisman Trophy winner, to now being thought of in many quarters, including these ones apparently, as being a system quarterback. Well, yeah, the, the first thing that comes to mind is I think we've got to stop putting a lot of stock in Heisman Trophy winners. But mm-hmm. putting that aside, look, the fact of the matter is that Winston's the number one guy, and it's not even close. Uh, he is natural. It's almost instinctive like a great point guard. With Mariota, I can't remember a single time that he threw the ball deep into tight coverage. He's not a a great passer. He's great at, at hitting guys that are wide open. He's great on his feet. But, yeah, it seems to me he's absolutely – and I don't want to pin the guy and say there's no way he'll be anything other than this, but from where we sit, viewing prospects, NFL prospects, he looks like someone who's great in a very intricate system. And if, uh, as Chris mentioned, if you put him in just your typical pro-style NFL offense, he's going to be like any other rookie. It's going to take him two or three years before he even gets there. And once he gets there, it's my opinion, which we'll see if it's proven out or not, it's my opinion that he's going to be Alex Smith, maybe a little bit better on his feet. But He'll be a a game manager. He'll be good but not great. And he definitely won't be worth what it's going to take teams to move up to get him. I think the Alex Smith comparison is a a very, very intriguing one. And as you and I have discussed off air, uh, even right down to being part of a a system in college uh, with with a coach that that doesn't necessarily translate to the NFL, that uh, is is a very uh, interesting point of comparison. In terms of the top quarterback in the draft, uh, and in all likelihood the top pick in the draft, Chris, this notion of Jameis Winston going number one, which appears to be cemented at this point, uh, and on the surface you can see why, because if he works out, he's the kind of franchise player that Tampa Bay needs. But I I just have to wonder about this. Coming off of the year after Johnny Manziel and uh, some of the other things in the NFL with uh, uh, Adrian Peterson, Ray Rice, uh, teams uh, talking about how they're going to be taking these things more into account in the future. There are very, very few high-profile players in recent years that have come into the league with more red flags off the field than Jameis Winston. Is this an instance of uh, short memory, given everything that we saw last year off the field in the NFL? I think human beings have a tendency to look at the attributes that they like. You know, men do it with women. Oh, she's really beautiful. <laughs> ignore all the vanity and the selfishness. Or, um, and I think GMs do the same thing. I think Jameis Winston, you know, scored well on the Wonderlick. He has all the physical tools. He can make all the throws. I mean, you, you look at him physically and you say, that's a guy who, you know, should be a star quarterback in this league for, you know, 15, 16 years, except for the fact that off the field he's immature and – potentially even, you know, had engaged in criminal activity on multiple occasions at times, um, you know, in his young life. You know, minor, well, I'm not going to get into the rape allegations, but, you know, the BB gun incident, the crab legs, and it comes back to judgment. And if this guy's going to be the face of your franchise, you know, you are really rolling the dice with him. Frankly, if I was a GM, he's not even on my board. i just take him off and that's it. And i do the same thing with Randy Greg. Uh, out of Nebraska. I mean, in Gregory's case, I mean, I just think he's an idiot. I mean, you, I'm sorry. And, and these are red flags for Winston, Gregory, and some other guys that, you know, history has shown us again and again and again, whether it's Josh Gordon, is that they may have all the talent in the world, but they never stop being a knucklehead. And, and if I was a GM, that's the first place I would start. Okay, you're a knucklehead, you're not on my book. You don't exist. Well, Jason, I could tell from the uh, from the laugh there that uh, the analogy was hitting home. Uh, this notion of perhaps Jameis Winston as uh, Lindsey Lohan, NFL GMs as a uh, a guy saying, "Hey, I'd hit that." So, thoughts <laughs> on the analogy, uh, Jason, in terms of uh, Jameis Winston being uh, the hot chick who uh, may not be worth the problems. Well, um, I, I definitely don't want to come off like it's not an issue because it is, 
And it's something that absolutely needs to be taken into account if you're that GM, especially if you're the GM of a team like the Bucks, who you know aren't exactly in a great position, uh, probably need a handful of, of good solid picks this year uh, just to get to respectability because last year was pretty awful. So you do need to consider it. I will say that I think there's a big difference between Jameis Winston and Randy Gregory. Uh, if Randy Gregory fell to the 30s, I don't think anybody would be uh, surprised at all. Because what Randy Gregory does is premeditatedly stupid. Now, I, I don't know who listening has any experience with these sorts of issues, but when you're going to essentially a job interview that's going to pay you a vast amount more than anybody else you're probably ever going to know in your life away from that industry, you gotta you got to tighten it up. Um, so that's a big one. The thing is that, and, and Chris used the word, it's knucklehead stuff. It's Winston is, is stupid, immaturity, garbage. But I have a sense that, that that's all it is. And I don't think this is going to be five years from now he still can't keep his, himself clean because it's knucklehead stuff. So I hope that there's a maturity that's going to come. It's still a risk. Here's the catch, though. When you look at Jameis Winston, and anybody that didn't watch a lot of him in college, <clears throat> just go back and watch the, the workout that he gave at the combine, which is something you don't normally see. It's, it's, I, there's no other way to say it. It's natural. He just has an ability to make the right throw with the right touch at the right angles. It, it's, you don't see it a lot. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw something out that's going to really upset some people. Uh, but hear me out. Jameis Winston – is the anti-Andrew Luck. And what I mean by that is, on the field, they all make, th- all make the throws. They, they both uh, have velocity, touch. They can do everything you want from a franchise quarterback. The difference is, there's n- no one in the front office at Indianapolis that's losing any sleep at night because for fear of a phone call at 3 in the morning about Andrew Luck. That's not going to happen. Now, there's a very real possibility it could with James Winston, so you just have to ask yourself, is it worth the risk to have arguably a top five quarterback five years from now uh, who's the face of your franchise and really, really taking you places? Or, as Chris alluded to, is it just not worth it and you'd rather ha- let somebody else deal with that stress? And that's the question the Bucks have. Uh, and I think based on what they need and, and what's available and what people will give up, I, I think they're forced into a corner. I think they have to take Winston, and I think they've already made that decision. It's not an easy position to be in, and uh, when we're talking about uh, gifted athletes at the uh, the skill positions here, uh, one of the next ones I think that's logical to get into would be at the running back position, Todd Gurley. I was joking with somebody the other day that uh, he is the highest-ranking running back to come out since, well, probably Trent Richardson. But, uh, again, a prototype, a big bruising back with uh, a lot of speed, and uh, something that I know, Chris, you've been picking up on being in the Cleveland area much like myself, uh, the notion of him going to the Browns on a lot of drafts, which I don't know if that would be the most Browns thing to do ever when they already have Mac and Viner 2K15 and a bunch of holes elsewhere. But uh, thoughts on what having a guy like uh, Todd Gurley out there about how that can apparently turn some brains to mush when people start projecting what he can do for you. Well, if you use the Browns as an example, um, yeah, they have two – solid young running backs that are complementary, but Gurley is far away more talented than anything the Browns have on the roster. And when you have either a young quarterback or no quarterback, and you are a team like the Browns that want to run the football and run it effectively, I like Todd Gurley, who seems to have the best package since Adrian Peterson in terms of skill and ability. He very easily projects to a top five running back in the NFL day one, um, and, it, and everything's healthy, I think, for sure. So if you're the Browns at 12 and he's there, it is seriously tempting um, if he's the top guy on your board to go and take him. Now, if I was the Browns and, and, and Gurley is there and somebody like Devontae Parker is there, I go with Parker because that's a far bigger glaring need at the moment because you do have two decent young running backs that prove they purposeful. And let's be honest, behind that line, behind that line, Rick, you know, even even on Sundays, you'd look pretty good. Sure. 
Yeah, and, and uh, you know, my, my lateral moves uh, back and forth, all i got to say is uh, the, the, the number one thing I can uh, talk about with that is getting juked out of my tennis shoes back in college playing a little bit of football in the parking lot by a guy that had double knee surgeries wearing boat shoes. That's about all you need to say about my ability to cover anybody. So, so a, bad, a bad moment with very representative. Uh, Jason, thoughts on this? Who, who do you tend more to agree with on this? Because uh, it sounds like uh, – Chris is a little bit more, uh, you know, open to uh, to taking Gurley. That, to me, with the Browns' copious needs that are out there, I, I get the greatness of him, and I think he's better than uh, Crowell, who is uh, the Browns' lead back at the moment. I get all of that, but as far as what you do, yeah, it is hard to pass on a guy with this kind of talent and upside, and it looks like he's going to be fully recovered from the knee injury. But this is almost a classic example right there, the encapsulation of really need versus uh, ultimate upside. Yeah, let me just start by saying there's only a few guys that this happens to, and he's one of them, that uh, the first time I see him, my reaction is is absolute, uh, I'm over the moon, and my next question is, when is he draft eligible? Um, So he was in that Adrian Peterson class for me. So to sit back, and if we were going to talk about the Browns specifically, to sit back and watch – the draft last year and then the signing of Crowell after the fact and then to see how they worked together, there was a part of me in the middle of the season last year that kind of died thinking, well, there goes Gurley. (laughs) Because the question you have to ask yourself, it's not who's better. It's not Crowell versus Gurley. It's what you have from Crowell and West compared to what you have at, say, wide receiver or defensive line or whatever it is, the, the glaring need you want to look at. Because to me, uh, if we take Chris's example, you pass on Gurley, but you get Parker, then Parker plus Crowell plus West is still better than Crowell, West, and Gurley, and nobody to throw to. So for me, as much as I love Gurley and as much as I'm positive uh, that he's going to be up there in that Adrian Peterson beast mode sort of conversation where he is a three down back. You just give him the ball, let him go. And I have no concerns about his injury history. All things being equal, I think Gurley's a top five pick, but things aren't all equal. Um, So in this case, although I agree with Chris's uh, enthusiasm for how good he's going to be, I still kind of side more on Rick's side for that. I'm not saying it has to be need versus best available. It needs to be best available within the need that you have. Uh, And if Parker's there, oh, God forbid, if Kevin White is still there, um, you take that best wide receiver. Now, if if three or four wide receivers go off the board in the first ten picks, then we've got to revisit this whole situation. But Gurley's going to be a beast, and sometimes you have to walk away from that. Excellent kind of uh, King Solomon there uh, between uh, Chris's and my point of view, and uh, I agree with you. Uh, that it's uh, it's uh, none of these things happen in a vacuum, and it's all about taking him plus whoever else is on your roster at these other positions. And uh, again, you guys have both referenced the wide receiver class. Certainly wanted to get into the top positions on this because wide receiver, defensive tackle are those two. Let's stay with the, uh, the skill positions at the moment. This draft, Chris. Uh, again, I don't know that on paper it's going to stack up to last year's, which I think is that's it's the one we've been waiting for. It's the, I think the second coming of the class of '96. Although it could, if enough of these guys work out, this class could possibly be right there with last year's, and, and that would really be something to have two historic crops in uh, back-to-back seasons. Uh, I know that with Jason, there's been a little bit of thought on uh, Cooper. And uh, what he may have in terms of upside versus some of the other guys. Where do you come down on this, uh, Chris, as far as uh, the top couple guys here and how they can define this draft class? Well, I think this draft class is going to be just as good as last year's. And and I don't think, and I just, uh, you know, I want you to know, I I think that this is going to become more and more common because you're going to, because I think the systems that guys are running in high school now and in college being so wide receiver focused, passing game oriented, that these wide receivers, these guys are the most talented guys on team now are moving into wide receiver positions. And I think you're going to see in the next 10 years better and better wide receiver classes. So I don't think this is, you know, 
I don't know what next year will be, but I think there's a trend where you're going to have deeper and deeper uh, wide receiver classes than you've had in a long time. Um, as far as this year goes, you know, I think we know what Cooper is, and, and, and he's going to go in the top ten, and somebody's going to pick him up just like the Bears, and they won't, you know, they won't miss on that. I mean, he's going to be a solid asset for a team. But I think Parker and White actually have their upside. And, um, you know, I'm excited, you know, you know for a standpoint that they could be available to uh, grab somebody like Parker at, at 12. So, you know, I think they're all pretty close. I mean, if one of those wide receivers would have followed Brown, I think they need to take him. To Jason's point, if they're all off the board, they thoroughly still on the board. And the Browns probably need to go in that direction. That uh, that will be a very interesting conundrum. There's a lot of mock drafts that, that have them going in that direction. Uh, a guy whose name is not generally coupled with the last couple of ones mentioned, almost exclusively because of off the field issues, because he's been pretty great between the lines when we've gotten a chance to see him. Doriel Green Beckham, uh, of course, from Oklahoma. And uh, Rob Rang on CBS Sports, uh, Jason, made an interesting point and, and said, uh, hey, Bear with me, but uh, the last name seems to be kind of apropos because he reminds me a little bit of A.J. Green and he reminds me a little bit of Odell Beckham, which uh, I thought was interesting. But uh, in terms of how these guys shake out, you've had the opinion for a while that Cooper is not the slam dunk number one pick, as perhaps it seemed he was going to be coming into the uh, the off season here. He would be the first wide out off the board. That uh, pick is becoming a little more mainstream. You were kind of ahead of your time on this, but. Uh, what are your thoughts on this year's class, and if uh, Chris is right, and it can be as great as last year's was? Well, um, the class on the whole, I think we have to really look at last year and stop being enamored that it was so good, um, and it was, but it was unconventional good. Because to be fair, Mike Evans was the only guy in last year's class that you look at physically as a prospect and go. Size, speed, ability, he looks like a prototypical number one. And the fact of the matter is that Odell Beckham and Sammy Watkins don't look like typical prototype number ones. However, production-wise, you guys think that they may be just that. So in this case, I think we're, it's, it's a little apples and oranges, but I think in this year's class, as opposed to last year's class, you've got eight to ten guys that prospect-wise project out as being number one, which is impressive. Um, I think the overall depth of last year might might trump it a little bit. Um, but as the class in general, uh, Chris may be onto something that this is a trend, maybe, because this draft class looks just as impressive as last, but in a different way. Now, uh, we'll get to some names, but as far as Amari Cooper, there's one of these in every single draft. There's one guy that because he plays on a high-profile program uh, and you've seen him on highlights or whatever, you're just automatically going to default to, oh, he's the guy. He's just the guy. Um, My concern is that when you step back and start reviewing these guys as prospects and not college players, you start to find some things that maybe aren't a concern but are the kind of thing that makes you step back from clear-cut number one. Uh, Amari Cooper is adequately sized. He is adequately fast. He's not game breaker fast, but he's game fast. Uh, my problem with him is he feels like a possession receiver. The other big problem is he catches with his arms entirely too much. And if you're a GM or a scout, you got to look at that and go, I don't know about this. And for anybody who's following up on the, the Browns, sidebars here this is Braylon Edwards all over again um he'd catch the thing with catching with his arms is a horrifying red flag um so is he going to be good absolutely he's going to be good is he top five worthy good god no uh to me when you look at this draft class you've got guys like Kevin White who have size and speed catch with their hands they're game changer type guys uh, Parker's up there. You could even make the argument that if used properly, maybe even a guy like Devin Smith could get into that conversation. Uh, Dorian, uh, Doriel Green Beckham, um, 
Brashard uh, Perriman from UCF, they all have, like, breakout ability. Home run hitters, the kind of guys that keep defensive coordinators up at night. I just don't see Amari Cooper that way. I see Amari Cooper as being sort of like eight years in Larry Fitzgerald. He catches everything, but he's not scaring anybody. So is that worth the number one spot at that position? For me, it's not. And for me, I'm going to be much more intrigued with a Kevin White or a Devontae Parker. But the draft class is going to be solid, no question about it. It is going to be, no question about it. And, uh, again, what's very interesting to me is it's a very, very deep class, and yet there continue to be uh, more guys uh, continuing to uh, work their way into the conversation here. Uh, Aguilar from uh, USC yeah. is rising up the board quickly in a lot of places. What, what are your thoughts on him? Yeah, uh, he's a guy I really liked. And just from a projection standpoint, I thought if he could fall to the top of the second, somebody's scoring. Major because he's now here's the thing Aguilar and Amari Cooper are not that different ability wise. Uh, mm-hmm. So the question is, do, do you if like let's say you're Oakland, do you spend the number four overall pick on a guy like that, or do you potentially trade back in around twenty five maybe and try to get Aguilar who's very very similar, but he's absolutely flying up up the board. Uh, I've seen mo- most recently as high as fifteenth overall. So. Aguilar is no joke, uh, and that's just another example. Once you get to him, you know, you're going to start to find some of these other guys, the Dorsett kid from Miami. There's a lot of good players in here that bring a different sort of thing. Now, Aguilar is not the home run hitter that some of these other guys are, but he's absolutely worth being in the conversation for first first round consideration. No question about it. Uh, for uh, In terms of uh, time constraints here, uh, let's kind of combine a little bit defensively, because I know we wanted to talk defensive tackles uh, outside of wide receiver. That might be the best position on the board this year. But, again, the pass rushers are very fascinating as well, both at OLB and defensive end. So, uh, Chris, uh, thoughts on uh, some of the top guys here? We talked a little bit about Gregory earlier and some of the red flags uh, surrounding him. But uh, you've got Leonard Williams, who was thought to be a very rare talent, who uh, were it not for Winston would be a candidate to go first overall. And, and may perhaps have gone first in, a, in uh, some past years. The year that Eric Fisher went first overall certainly springs to mind. So thoughts on some of the guys uh, in the trenches and then some of the pass rushers as well who could be game changers. For teams. He is just a beast, and he is going to dominate in the trenches uh, in that tackle position. I mean, he you know, he's a guy that, that the Bucks really ought to think about drafting number one. Um you know, you look at some guys like Danny Shelton. I know a lot of people are really high on him, and he's got great feet, and he's big, and he's powerful. Um, I worry about his weight. I worry about his condition long term. Um, you know, and I also think, you know, he's a two-gap run defender. Um, I'm really high on Malcolm Brown out of Texas because I think he can do more. Um, I think move him, you know, three, four, four, three. I think he's a little more versatile. Um, I also think he's really smart, and um, I think that's helpful. You know, like I said earlier, Randy Gregory's not even on my board. It's time for GM. Um, but there is a lot of good defensive backs, and stuff. there's a lot of talent out there uh, you know, to be had for GM, especially, you know, there's two rounds. No question about it. And uh, an interesting point that Chris raised, Jason, is players uh, out there, you, you've got to think there's a little bit more value attached to them when they're not as system dependent. Certainly Malcolm Brown, as he cited uh, at Texas, you could picture him in either a 3-4 or a 4-3, and uh, you can't say that about everybody, that's for sure. So thoughts on uh, some of the, uh, the dominators both in the trenches and uh, coming off the edges defensively in the draft this year? Well, I've uh, I've had a Haloti not a love affair with Danny Shelton since – Probably about November. Um, yeah, those that have been with us the entire time will remember me banging the table for Haloti not a years ago. Um, yes. But um, I really like Danny Sheldon. And 
because of the comparison, you're going to get this position eligibility, flexibility situation where you say, well, look, he can play nose, he can play three technique, whatever, uh, which is why I like him. Because even if uh, your team switches from a 3-4 to a 4-3, he still works. Um, Eric Armstead, totally different deal. He looks like a freak physically. He's ridiculously large, uh, more height than weight, but and, and really does kind of – play more like a defensive end in a defensive tackle's body. I like him a lot. I do like Malcolm Brown. Um, but as far as the interior defensive lineman, for me, it's really Danny Shelton and everybody else. Uh, I would almost say I would rather have um, Brown over Armstead, and that has nothing to do with scheme. Just I like the player better. Uh, as far as on the on the outside, though, this is a really sexy pass rusher draft. Um, and, and I say that as it's causing me problems because we keep hearing about Bud Dupree flying up the board, uh, almost getting into that top ten range. And, and the scary thing here is, and I don't know if you guys are getting this vibe, but the whole Bud Dupree thing, and when any highlights you see of him, aside from just sitting down and watching a game, the highlights remind me so much of Barkevius Mingo. The guy was projected to go middle to late first round, then all of a sudden he's flying up the board, and then you watch him and you go, yeah, but he's not hes not overpowering guys. He's not faster than guys, but he makes plays in the field. Uh, okay. <laughs> so my concern there is that we're having a Barkevious Mingo thing, but Fowler, uh, Leonard Williams, if you want to uh, go there and, and consider him playing, you know, the three technique uh, in a three-four is nice. Um uh, Vic Beasley is a guy who's not getting talked about right now, and that's a huge concern because I don't know. Right now, it's 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 a flip of the coin between him and Shane Ray to me, uh, and that may depend on scheme. But the pass rushers are probably the the sexy part of this draft, and I would not be surprised if you see five, six, even seven guys go in the first twenty picks. Uh, it's that impressive. So. If your team uh, has a need at that that position, and I think the collectively the three of us definitely have an interest in pass rusher, uh, you're going to have to take care of that quickly because if you don't, you're you're going to be staring at the top or the middle of the second round um, with not the same prospects you were hoping for. So, defensive end, outside linebacker, three four four three doesn't really matter. There are players to be had there, and defensive tackle may actually be the most intriguing at the top with those three to four uh, defensive tackles that are going to go in the first round or at least the first 35 picks. Uh, But, of course, my favorite being Danny Shelton and Vic Beasley. There is some incredible talent in there, no question about it. And as you said, with the pass rushers, yeah, it does start to get more fallow in round two. Uh, It's not as deep as uh, some positions like uh, wide receiver where you can maybe wait a little bit longer and Mm -hmm. still get somebody there. I want to ask you guys a macro-level question, as we often like doing on the show here, because there was a tweet that I came across from NFL Network's Ian Rappaport, and uh, there's two ways to take this. One is that either you can look at it and say, we're through the looking glass now, or you can look at it and say, well, teams are just taking into account the full range of what value constitutes. Ian Rappaport tweeted, and I'm paraphrasing here, he is hearing increasingly from teams this year that when they're figuring out what a player is worth, they're looking at a lot of mock drafts out there. So, Jason, who knows? Maybe there's some some eyeballs on yours and mine, optimistically. But (laughs) regardless, uh, there is this thought that uh, teams are taking that into account. To me, that actually makes perfect sense because if you're seeing a lot of the same names in the same places everywhere, that sort of indicates what the market value is. Chris, I know you're a guy with some uh, real uh, philosophies on uh, market value, whether it be in football, economics, or anything else. I'll start with you. What what are your thoughts on teams taking this kind of uh, chatter into account? (laughs) I think think a team that is basing their uh, value analysis on a player based on mock drafts, I think that's that's a GM in the scouting department that ought to be terminated immediately. <laughs> is that, is it do, do you think it's godless for teams to do that? March down and say, that's an owner who should march down and say, I don't need all of you guys because I can buy all the magazines and I can look at SDH and I can look at, I can use their analysis and I can just talk to Jason on the phone 
and go ahead and make these picks myself. If this is if this is how we are, mar- this is how we are determining value uh, on these players. Okay, so is is there a gutless thing in your estimation of where teams are looking at this and figuring, uh, hey, we can't possibly be hit for taking this guy even if he fails because everybody else said he should go here? Do you think that's a component of it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, and I'll use, the, you know, because they're my team, I'll use the Browns as a great example. You know, everybody just dogs the Browns for their draft picks, you, you know, since 99. But how often have the Browns actually made a draft pick that the supposed experts come out and say they're out of their minds, that pick? Let's go back to, you know, look at Courtney Brown. You know, everybody said, this guy is going to be all-world, all-pro. He's dominant. He's everything. You know, and every, they, they picked him, and the, everybody cheered. Great pick by the Browns. Uh, last year, everybody had Gilbert as the first or second best cornerback in the draft. They pick him. Uh, and so, let me tell you, I, I don't know, maybe the answer is the Browns have been doing this since 99. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> maybe they've been grabbing the sporting news mock draft, and that's what they've been going off since 99. So, you know, I, I <laughs> go through the Browns draft for years, and say, other than a few a few ones that were obviously horrible, like Big Money or you know, William Green, um, you know, most people applauded their picks. And, you know, this was an expert. So when they, uh, you know, I see those same experts on the TV or on radio uh, preparing for this draft saying, boy, you know, the Browns just can't get a draft right. I'm like, yeah, that includes all of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that seems like a good way to bring this full circle. Jason, your your thoughts on teams out there potentially listening to monkeys like us and what we're saying ahead of time? Uh, for every single team except the one uh, in western Pennsylvania, uh, by all means, uh, you can get my phone number, and I would be more than happy to uh, play GM for you if you'd like. Uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna. This has been a nice, fun thing, and everyone's been agreeing for the most part. And I'm, I'm gonna play a little devil's advocate on this one. Um, for every Courtney Brown, there is a Sean Thompson, Willie Green. Tim Couch, and people can say that, that Tim Couch was a pick that people wanted, but it was also a pick where every analyst said, this guy drew up plays in the dirt. So take that for what it is. But I, I think if you go down the list for every single Courtney Brown example, or even Gerard Warren, where people said, yes, that's the guy you take, I think there are two to three uh, picks that you just go, what are you doing? And here's where I'll – bring it together if if there are gms out there that are sort of checking the wires so to speak looking to see where um mock drafters are putting people i would say use that as a tool in congress with everything else if you're looking at it as a form of identifying market value then maybe there's something to it because the problem is when a team like the browns goes and picks barkevious mingo uh, and everyone's real excited because, like, oh, he's a nice player. Yeah, but look at what it was two days ago. He wasn't supposed to go that high. You were trying to be more clever than everybody else, and the only way you can adequately do that is be reincarnated as Bill Belichick or find a way to, to gauge market value. And if you've got 100,000 people who say Todd Gurley deserves to go in the top 10, then don't sit there and try to wait on him in the 20s thinking you're going to get him. Now, do I think it should replace scouting? Absolutely not. And if that's the case, yes, go with Chris's way and march that owner down the hall and get him the heck off of your premises because that's ridiculous. But if you're doing all the scouting and all the prospecting and all this work and you're also consulting the Internet to see where the consensus is on market value. I don't think that's a bad thing. I just don't think that you should weight it very high. I actually kind of agree with that because, again, like you said, maybe it can be a little bit of a check against uh, doing something like the Sean Thompson picks, the Barkevious Mingo picks, where uh, the rest of the world will look at you like you got a hole in your head because sometimes the rest of the world is right about that. And uh, unfortunately, every time I, as a Browns fan, have shrieked about something like that, I've been right, which is actually a curse. But uh, <laughs> kind of a depressing note to bring this full circle on. But uh, as always, a grade A conversation uh, with you guys about the NFL draft. This has been one of the greatest traditions in the FBA. Lounge to do this. Looking forward to uh, reconvening afterwards. 
and seeing what everybody thought. Chris Galloway, Jason Jones, many thanks to you fellas. Appreciate it for a great conversation, guys. Thank you, gentlemen. Always a pleasure. Excellent. Thank you both. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today for FPH Lounge Mini Episode number 558. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, All Clear Channel Affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Out. Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Papermate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse and the Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements. 